today, an episode to wrap up our second annual Cocktails and Crips, a spooked... I can't even do it anymore. Ooh! A lesson in finding better, more legal ways to pay your mortgage, and a caper that involved a teller thinking she was in the middle of a Halloween prank. Surprise, it was no prank, but a strange, strange crime with an extremely relatable motive. Welcome to Capers and Cocktails, a true crime podcast that doesn't take itself too seriously and gives you something to enjoy while you listen. The following content may be disturbing to some. Discretion is advised. If you're enjoying one of our themed cocktails, ensure you're of legal drinking age and have fun, but drink responsibly. Okay, we're going to need to start this caper with a drink because it's a bit of a rough case. Definitely not as funny as I like to be with my capers, Halloween season or otherwise. For this episode, things are looking a little more, well, sad, rough, a strange caper nonetheless. So we're doing it, but let's start with a drink, shall we? Sangri, deriving from the Spanish word sangria, meaning bloody, was a popular drink in colonial America, maintaining its appeal until the late 19th century. This punch, made from sweetened and diluted red wine spiced with nutmeg, was likely introduced to the Americans from the Caribbean where it had been made since at least the late 17th century. In North America, sangaree was served either hot or cold, depending on the season. It largely vanished in the United States by the early 20th century. In the 20th century, sangria became Spain's national iced drink and remained popular in the Caribbean, enjoyed by American tourists in the tropical climate. Sangria reappeared in the United States in the late 1940s, consumed by Hispanic Americans, and featured in Spanish restaurants. It gained broader attention in 1964 when showcased at the Spanish Pavilion at the New York World's Fair. Bring World's Fair back say that every time. The drink's popularity soared in the 1970s with Iago Santgria, a commercial sangria being imported from Spain. Sangria's popularity likely inspired the commercial wine coolers made from white wine and fruit juice that emerged in the early 1980s. And we're making a spooky sangria today, folks. This particular drink is a measure with your heart kind of drink, in my opinion. I'm making a small batch for just a few drinks, but you can add or remove any parts of this that you want. It's a very flexible cocktail. The first thing you need to do is cut up one apple and then use Halloween cookie cutters to make fun shapes with it. You can do the same with the orange if it'll work, but it probably won't work. Find a blood orange if you can. Add to that one third cup blackberries and one third cup pomegranate seeds. Toss all of this with a tablespoon of lemon juice. Add those to a punch bowl or a pitcher. I only have a pitcher. And then pour in one third bottle light red wine, one cup blood orange Italian soda, one ounce cream de cassis, or you can use any berry flavored liqueur. And then if you think you need it, a half an ounce of simple syrup. Stir it up and drink it up. For the mocktail version, the only difference is that you're omitting the cream de cassis and substituting grape juice for wine. A spooky sangria that today's caperers could actually enjoy the the mocktail. Spoiler alert. It was a mild, windy fall day in Barnegat Township, New Jersey, a small township in the very middle of the state. It was a seemingly ordinary day, actually, for the tellers at Sun National Bank on South Main Street, when a little before 11.45 a.m. on Halloween Eve Eve 2002, two people, described as short, walked into the front door of the bank, wearing dark clothes. One of them was in a ski mask, and the other covered their face with a nylon stocking. One of them had dirty blonde hair in a ponytail, and the other wore dark hair in a white or pink bandana. They approached one of the two tellers on duty and pulled out a silver automatic pistol. They demanded all of her cash. The teller, at first, thought it was a Halloween prank, a joke, but it was no joke. And in less than a minute, the teller had handed over all of her cash, and they had filled a plastic garbage bag they brought into the bank with their spoils. They started to walk away, and one of the burglars took two steps and came back and said, Is that all of it? The teller responded, Yes, we keep very little money here. So the two fled out the front door and then circled around at the back of the bank. They ran to Memorial Drive and then turned north and disappeared from view. The bank employees, after alerting authorities, posted a handwritten sign on the front door that said, we are closed for a short while due to difficulties. Thank you. No customers were in the bank at the time, and the tellers were in no way injured. The culprits escaped the bank with $3,550. Even in 2024 dollars, that's just over $5,200. 
Behind the bank, officers found what looked like a gun magazine on the ground, but Reno, the canine officer for the Barnegat Police Department, was only able to track the scent to Memorial Drive, where the suspects had fled to before returning to the patrol car. You true crime enthusiasts might have some idea of why that was. Stay tuned. By November 1st, authorities knew they were looking for women, and specifically young women, between the ages of 15 and 20, and they had a clearer idea of their height. One girl was five foot two inches and the other was five foot four inches, both with medium builds. Originally, investigators suspected that the two suspects may have been using the money to buy heroin. Police questioned local high school students, seeing if they knew the suspects. And the same week, they also got photos, but did not release them. Local residents were surprised that the suspected culprits were so young. One resident would say, quote, their age was the first thing that surprised me without a doubt, end quote. Some newspapers used the opportunity to comment on the increase in crime committed by women in the early 2000s, which wasn't super dramatic of an increase, if we're being honest. American female bank robbers went from 299 in 1995 to 561 in 2000, so, you know. One week later, the jig was up. Police had shown images from the surveillance footage to some folks around town, and someone recognized one of the girls. Apparently, according to Ocean County Prosecutor Thomas Kahaler, quote, the kids were leaving the bank and one of their disguises either came off or was taken off, end quote. And yeah, they were kids. 15-year-old fraternal twins Chelsea and Alicia Wortman had robbed the Sun National Bank just before Halloween, and the teenage Thelma and Louise were in big, big trouble. They were each charged with armed robbery, possession of a firearm, and theft. The reason that the canine hadn't been able to track the girls beyond Memorial Drive was that their own mother, 34-year-old Kathleen Wordman Jones, had acted as their getaway driver, parking and idling her car on a dirt access road about 100 yards away from the bank. She would be charged with armed robbery, possession of a weapon for an illegal purpose, and theft. She would also later be charged with using a juvenile to commit a criminal offense. That's a much, much higher charge. The girl's stepfather, 37-year-old Kevin Jones, would also be arrested because even though he claimed he did not know about the crime in advance, he did help the twins get rid of the clothing they wore during the robbery, and then he took the stolen money and went to a local casino to launder it. A 16-year-old stepsister who helped to plan the crime would also be arrested and then released into the custody of either her grandmother or her aunt. Newspapers vary. Police would recover $2,700 of casino laundered cash and a pellet gun from the house, with its tip painted silver with nail polish. It was a toy that fired plastic pellets at a Velcro target. But why? What on earth would compel this wild plot? The family was broke. Broke and desperate. The morning of the robbery, their mortgage lender, Wells Fargo, had filed a motion to foreclose on the family home that they had bought two years earlier after the family missed the first two $413 mortgage payments after mom filed for bankruptcy in July. They also owed money to 11 other creditors, including three townships, seven medical facilities, and a Dover Township car dealership, according to bankruptcy records. Police were shocked at both the nature of the crime and the macabre chore the girls had been given. Neighbor Carrie Dempsey would say, quote, I just can't even believe a mother would let her children do something like this. What kind of conversation could they have had? I want you kids to put masks on and I'll wait in the car. For $3,500, they ruined their lives, end quote. And the girls themselves were described as reserved and sweet. After their arrest, police described them as polite and respectful. Chelsea had a goal of going to cosmetology school. A pre-Halloween disaster, no doubt. Prosecutors opted not to charge the twins as adults, a decision I definitely, definitely agree with. After they were sentenced, the family court system that they found themselves in placed a high emphasis on education and rehabilitation. Inmates, or residents, as offenders were called by the State Juvenile Justice Commission, participated in year-round educational and vocational programs, community service, and recreation. Chelsea and Alicia Wortman were sentenced to four years in one of those juvenile facilities. A condition of that plea bargain was that they would testify against their stepfather. And before their parents went to trial, mom actually asked the girls to lie in court to save them from prosecution. Nice. Both mom and stepdad would get additional charges of witness tampering added to their tab. When she testified at her stepdad's trial, Chelsea told the Tom's River court, quote, I saw that my family was upset. 
that money was needed, so I decided to rob a bank, end quote. Chelsea testified that her mom initially tried to stop her, saying, quote, you're not going to do that. You're not going to get in trouble, end quote. But Chelsea said she was determined to go ahead with the robbery. She said, quote, I let her know if you're not coming, I'm still doing it, end quote. So mom went. When Alicia testified, at one point she snapped at the prosecutor. Looking briefly at her stepfather, she said, quote, I'm mad at him and my mom for getting me into this situation, end quote. Hmm. Mom would plead guilty to her crimes and would be sentenced to 15 years in prison. Superior Court James Sitta would say, quote, They may have been inclined to be bad children. They may have been inclined to commit a criminal offense, but they were encouraged, directed, manipulated, and induced by their mother to commit this robbery, end quote. On the other hand, mom's niece would say, quote, You could never picture her doing anything like this. I know she's more sorry than anyone could imagine, end quote. Kevin would end up having a mistrial when the jury could not come to a conclusion on his guilt or innocence on nine charges in late September 2003. Instead of facing a retrial, he decided to plead guilty to hindering apprehension and receiving stolen property. In exchange for the plea, prosecutors dropped the more serious charges in his 10-count indictment, including child endangerment, money laundering, and witness tampering. He would appear on an episode of The John Walsh Show, defending his wife and stepdaughters. He would eventually find himself sentenced to four years in state prison for his role in the heist. He would say, quote, I would not want anybody to walk in my shoes and have to make the decisions I had to make, but all of my decisions were based on my family, end quote. Thanks for hanging out with me. I didn't do any research about the girls after this crime because I think they deserve their privacy and ability to have a peaceful adult life. I certainly hope they got it. Oh, and this case was the inspiration for a 2012 Lifetime original movie, Teenage Bank Heist. Now, I watched this movie for research, of course, and I'll just say it's really more of an inspiration versus any sort of accurate portrayal of what actually happened. It is linked in the description box if for some reason you're bored on a Wednesday night or something. Speaking of description box, make sure to go there to spot the quickest way to follow me on all the social media. And here's a toast to a great spooktober. I hope we can be even capier and spookier next season. I'll see you next week. And remember, there are always alternatives to making your children rob a bank for you. Yeah, she definitely did it. <laughs>